So we left off uh, I don't remember how we left off yesterday with I think it was be kind to yourself. That was yeah, closing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, which applies at every moment. Nothing else need be said actually, probably. Uh, And from there, I would like to continue on with the precepts. Uh, you know, in a general way, I'm not going to go through all 16 precepts. Uh, it's not really necessary, and this is not the context for it. We could do a course studying them, and we do, in the terms of our practice, study the precepts. Usually, the, towards the end of our koan study, uh, some some teachers and uh, lineages, well, even within our lineage, some teachers uh, have a study of the precepts leading up to receiving them, which is, is really a wonderful thing. I have not got my act together enough to do that yet, but I may at some point. Um, my own, our teacher did not do that, so that's how we were trained. Uh, before I did my jukai, I had never seen a jukai ceremony, and I had no idea what was transpiring. Uh, and that was very powerful. Even during that week leading up to when Corinne and I received the precepts, uh, our teacher's teacher, Gempo, was there. And I have the memory that he gave the talks all week. Did, did, did Roshi not give any talks? I think she, she did. Yeah, at least one. That may be one. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> that, <yeah. laughs> and, uh, I remember him saying at one point, so, you know, someone asked me, uh, because there's two guys, somebody asked me to talk about the precepts. And he said, so what do you think? Does anyone want to hear that talk? And I remember myself very strongly thinking, maybe even saying no. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't, I don't think it was because of me, but he didn't give the talk. <laughs> Do you remember? Yeah. He didn't give a talk about the precepts that week. So this is kind of the climate in which I was trained. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried to <coughs> modify, and I some Karin Roshi too, Karin Sensei, sorry, uh, has, has, you know, has changed as well. She <coughs> to adapt to the situation. Which brings me directly to the precepts. Originally, what we now consider the 16 precepts, the bodhisattva precepts that we use, uh, came from, but in a very indirect way now, um, the original community around the historic Buddha, the first person who put all of these things into place. And he developed guidelines for his community that specifically applied to those people, that time, and that place, and that situation. Because for the harmonious functioning of the group, he needed some guidelines. Just like here we have guidelines for what we do. You, know, you wash your cup after your tea. We eat in Oryoki. There's someone who's in charge of the kitchen. We have all these guidelines that we have in order to function as a group, as a one body, harmoniously. And historically, that's what happened. And he developed rules according to the, his situation that applied very specifically to those people that time and that place. None of which probably apply to us today. Because we don't live in the same place, the same time, we're not the same people, it's not the same situation. Um, one of the famous examples that 
in some traditions, Buddhist schools, still exists. And in some schools, there are many, many, many more precepts, particularly for monastic people. Um, and in some of those schools, some of the original precepts from the Buddha still exist. But one that, and I don't know much about that, uh, one, however, that I have heard about um, is that in the Buddha's day, cotton was considered a fabric that was luxurious and rare. And so the Buddha's disciples, the people in his community, he wanted them to live simply, and he wanted them all to live in the same way. And he had rich people and poor people and ordinary people who came to practice with him, and he wanted them all on the same level, as it were. So he didn't want the rich people to have different clothing than the poor people, and he didn't want anyone to have anything special and or extraordinary and rich and expensive. So they took rags, basically, for their clothing and made it. And that's, the, that's how we ended up with this. These bits of fabric sewn together. So one of the rules was no cotton. So nobody was supposed to have cotton. That rule became and even today in some schools, a monk is not to even stand on anything made of cotton. So no cotton socks, for example. Or no cotton rugs. No cotton sheets. Not, no cotton clothing, of course. Nothing should be cotton. Although today, cotton is one of the most ordinary. It's a very common fabric that everyone wears and uses for various things. So today, if we were to try to simplify things within the context in which we live, eliminating cotton would not be one of them. Because that, that it's not rare, it's not expensive, uh, it's easily accessible, uh, everyone can have it and look the same, and wear the same kind of clothing. Um, and there's a story that comes from the Zen center of Los Angeles in Maizumi Roshi's day when a Theravadan monk came to visit. And in the Theravadan tradition, they have this no cotton rule. And all of their cushions, seats, mats, everything was cotton. Probably the sheets in his bed were cotton. So they had to be very careful and eliminate everything that was cotton especially for this monk, which goes against completely the spirit of the rule, which was to not do anything special, not just ordinary, just everyone the same. I just say this example to make it clear what the intentions of these precepts were originally and still are today, although they're not the same because they depend on the situation, the time and the place, the people and the quantity, you say. Those are the four basic points that we have to keep in mind when we're looking at these precepts. And as I said the other day, these are not about uh, orders or commandments or rules for how to live. Because how to live, for each of us, depends on our situation, who we are, what our life is. And it's always changing. There is no set. In any circumstance, there is no set right way of behaving, uh, acting, treating other people, whatever. It's not fixed, which is the good news and the bad news, right? Because we like to have things strict, fixed, sometimes. Because then we know exactly what to do, we know exactly what not to do, and it doesn't depend on me anymore. Someone is telling me what to do. 
the same time, we really don't like that either. We don't want anyone to tell us what to do. We want to do what we want to do. Both are extremes that are not the spirit of the precepts. And as we said, we, I think we said yesterday and today, the precepts are not something outside of us. They are just a reflection of our, who we are, what we are. And that applies to what the Buddha originally set in place and to what we do now. So, um, from, I don't even know when, where they came from or when I, they were made. And I like to have them as a security blanket you know, so that I can look and say, oh, did I forget this? Did I forget that? Like I said the other day. Um, And just to help me uh, situate, because, because I have never actually myself studied the precepts like you would in school, you know, where you memorize things and you learn point A, point B, point C, little one, little two, little three, and never get it. And so what I know of the precepts is experiential. And also, even when we, as I said, we study it at, when we're far advanced in our koan practice, we study the precepts like koans. Meaning, again, it's experiential. So this is not, I haven't read books about the precepts or you know, attended classes about the precepts. So what I'm giving you is experiential, the fruits of my experience, let's say. But that's always what I give you. That's what sense I gave you yesterday. It's the fruits of experience. There's nothing else we can say. At the same time, so then I note little things so that I use them as bookmarks almost. Bookmarks in my experience. Something like that. And then I also have the text that I use in the ceremony so I know exactly the order and what is said when and all of those things. Um, so as I said, there are 16 precepts. Um, the first is broken down into three parts, as I said. So the first part is what we call the three treasures. I think I mentioned this the other day. The three treasures, the three pure precepts, and then the ten grave precepts. So a way of seeing it is that the, the, the first, the three treasures are really just actually the one treasure, which is Buddha. So, the first one is be Buddha. The first of the three treasures is be Buddha. And when I say that that's really, that's the only one that counts, ultimately, because that is oneness. That is unity. That is non-separation, what we say. This is the ultimate reality. It's not that it's better or worse, but it's the all-encompassing aspect of reality. Nothing is excluded. In fact, there's nothing inside or outside. And we say Buddha, that means the awakened one, uh, the one who has awakened to this, the one who has experienced this. Now, so if, if we experience that, then we experience all of it. However, we break this down and we say the second one is be Sangha. Uh, be Dharma, sorry, the third one is be Sangha. Be Dharma. Dharma is diversity, manyness, the um, difference. So, as opposed to, if we think of it as opposed to oneness, then this is manyness. Okay, 
uh, let's just go on to the third one, which is B, Sangha. And Sangha, then, is the harmony of the first two. What? what? B Dharma, you said? B Dharma is the second, and B Sangha is the third. I, I mean, initially said it wrong. Um, Sangha is the harmony of the previous two. The previous two are not actually separate, but we think of them as being separate. And the way that they can manifest together is Sangha. Okay? Um, the So, so we can look at those three treasures and being, because in the ceremony we say, at one point we say be and then being, or being and be, uh, we can see just the three treasures together as just um, a manifestation of the reality, of total reality, okay? It's aspect of oneness, it's aspect of diversity, and the harmony of the two functioning together. Okay, so in your life, all of those are present at every moment. The oneness, the diversity, and the two together. You can say you are you, individual you. You come here with your different qualities, your age, your sex, whatever it is. That's the manyness. That's the diversity. We are one group. And all of those different manifestations are one. And then they, when we function together, that's the functioning of the harmony. That's the harmony of it together. When the individualities are expressed within the oneness, it's always the case, but we don't want to see it. So then we have the what we call the three pure precepts, which are actually, um, we can call them, we can say that's the body of the three treasures. And these pure, pure precepts can come across as sounding like orders. Right? I will discuss them and you will see that that's not what they are. So the first one is Cease from evil. Okay, now we can get into a discussion. What is evil? <laughs> what is cease? Uh, we may go there, but just for now, the first one is cease from evil. The second one is do good. And the third one is do good for others. Cease from evil is passive in the sense of um, just stopping, taking a step back and saying, is what I'm doing evil? Am I going against the grain of life or of the situation? The second one is active in the sense that doing good, so can I contribute to this situation to make it good for me, what I'm doing? Can it be positive? Can I contribute so that I'm, you know, I'm coming to a Zen retreat. That's something that I'm doing for myself that's good. We could say that, okay? So the first two are really about me, okay? I'm stopping from doing evil, and I'm doing good for me. The last one, which is do good for others, is then for others. So it means, am I doing something that can uh, help others to realize life? The second one is, can I be doing something for myself to help realize my life? The third one is, am I doing something to help others realize their life? 
there's often some confusion about, uh, so I'm going to stop doing something that's harmful for myself, that will be ceased from evil. I'm going to do something actively that is good for myself and my realizing my way. And the last one, I'm going to do something that's good for others to realize their way. Okay? But these really just come out of the first three. The Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Okay? It's all interconnected. Because it's all one, anyway. These are just different aspects. Um, now, what is interesting, too, is... I have this here somewhere. Um, is that these, these three, all of these, um, the three treasures and particularly the three pure precepts, um, I like to expand upon them a little bit um, in, the cer in the ceremony um, and add, so, let's see, there's my first page. So, when I, when I do the three treasures, for example, I'm inspired by Bernie Glassman in this. We say, be one with the Buddha, okay? And I add, the awakened nature of all beings. Or Bernie would be something like, oh no, that's it, that would be what he would say, something like that. Um, so this really is my nature and the nature of all beings. Buddha, the Buddha treasure, okay? The Dharma treasure, uh, this notion of diversity, it's the ocean of wisdom and compassion. We use flowery language in ceremonies, but it's actually just, you know, the ocean of everything that is. It's, you know, the train passing the birds, the, the goats, the children, the adults, the camera, the tea, the the water, the plant that's in it, uh, it's everything, okay? Um, and the Sangha treasure, be one with the Sangha, is the interdependence of all creations. So the interdependence of it all. The interconnection and interdependence of it all. Um, and actually, I didn't read it completely. The ocean of yeah, you know, the ocean of wisdom and compassion. Yeah, and then the interdependence of all of it. Okay, how it all fits together, how it all works together harmoniously. Um, and then the three pure precepts. Bernie Glassman, I'm also inspired, but I don't do that exactly like he does it because he has adapted them and uses them as the the tenets of his order. Is in peacemaker order. Um, so his would be the first precept, which we would say, uh, "I vow to cease from evil." He would his precept, not knowing. We'll go back over this, but I vow to do good. His is bearing witness, and I vow to do good for others. His is. Taking, I don't think he uses this anymore, loving action, but taking action or something. Forget, he doesn't say loving action anymore. Um, so I have uh, <laughs> adapted them so that we say, I vow to cease from evil, giving up fixed ideas about myself and the universe. So. Why do we say that? Because what creates the evil, as it were, or what creates what is harmful, is having fixed ideas about myself in the universe. So every conflict you can imagine arises from having a fixed idea about myself in the universe. And any harm that is inflicted intentionally, let's say, may not be consciously, but intentionally, arises from that. I have a fixed idea, I don't like that person, and so I will ignore him. Or, um, I don't agree with the way those people see their spiritual life, and so I will blow them up. Or, um, you know, I don't uh, 
agree with people who don't eat meat, and so I will yell at them and give them orders, or something, whatever. <laughs> um, so giving up fixed ideas about myself and the universe is essential. That's the first thing. I cease my evil ways, as it were, by that. The next one, I vow to do good. I add from Bernie's little thing, his little version. What does he say? OK, yeah. So I use his bearing witness, bearing witness to the joy and suffering of the world. So this is active in the sense of, OK, I'm giving up my fixed ideas, and then I'm going there in any situation when I am doing good for myself, initially, in that situation, is just being with whatever it is. So, you know, yesterday I was talking about, um, I forget even what, what was anger or what was the subject, something about emotions or something we were, we were saying, you know, be with them, intimate, be intimate, intimate, yeah. Well, when you bear witness, you are becoming intimate with. You are just there with. You've let go of your fixed ideas about the situation. And you are just there, bearing witness. In fact, the way that Bernie Glassman defines what we call shikantaza, it's this Japanese term for just sitting, is bearing witness to the whole of life. Now, this is a very advanced practice, but we can aspire to that. And we can say we will live our lives with that as a guideline. And then the last one I vow to do good for others, obviously, um, it's taking action according to the situation, according to the time, the place, the people, and the quantity of what's happening. Um, initially, for, for many years, in Bernie's order, it was taking loving action. And then he decided that that was too directive, even, because we don't even know that. We don't even know that it's loving action. How do we define loving action? You know? um, then I think there was a time when it was taking healing action. And I don't know what it is now. Does anyone who, do you know what it is now? Just the action. Just, just whatever just action arises. Arises. Very yes, exactly. Which makes sense. Because we don't know. So if we let go of our fixed ideas and we're just there, we trust that we'll arise. And we said this yesterday. We trust that we'll arise is the appropriate action. You know, there are a lot of nuances in this. We won't get into that. But this is the, these are the guidelines. Okay. Um, it's like, and as we pointed out, uh, in psychoanalysis, I don't know so much about other therapies, but there is this notion, and Delphine knows this, could tell us, that, that it's, it's the same idea, the same principle. You, you give up your fixed ideas about whatever is there, the person who is talking, or you, you, or whatever. Just bear witness to it. And if something arises, then it arises. It doesn't, it doesn't. It's appropriate. Whatever is appropriate. Um, now, these, the, the three pure precepts, um, yeah, I guess that's all I need to say about those, according to whatever notes I can see at this point. But I can't really see this written in all kinds of pencils and pens and little and big and pretty and whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, uh, we move on from those three treasures and the three, pre three pure precepts to the grave precepts. Um, and I'm not going to go into them all. Uh, We'll just, as I said yesterday, if we just stay with the first one, um, although it's important to receive all of them and see them, see the first one broken down into different uh, 
facets, aspects, but there's no point really in doing it now. Um, so the first one is, um, the big one, I vow to refrain from non-killing. And did I say I was about to refrain from non killing? Yes. Yeah. 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 I was mixing the two words. <laughs> <laughs> so I vow to refrain from killing. Okay. But apparently the Japanese word for this precept, I forget where I read this, um, or heard this, is translates more as non killing. It's not so much I vow to refrain from killing as non-killing. So we can see this from different aspects as well. Like I said, <coughs> I said the other day that there were three ways you can look at the you can look at from the, the literal, from the subjective, or from the intrinsic aspect, each precept. So if we looked at this one from the intrinsic, non-killing, from that point of view, nothing is born and nothing dies. So there is no killing. There is nothing to kill, there is no, no one to kill, there is nothing to kill. Nothing is born, nothing dies. This is conceptual if it's, in, as with everything, it remains a concept unless it's experiential. So it doesn't matter so much if that is our experience. We aspire to that experience, but that's, it's important to know that that is a fundamental aspect of reality. Okay? If we looked at it from the subjective, uh, from the literal, there is absolutely no killing whatsoever. So, there is no situation when killing is acceptable. There is no justification for killing. That's the literal no killing. If we look at it from the subjective point of view, and we say, it depends. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is the compassionate point of view. Um, we don't know. In any given situation it may be necessary. So I was thinking today of an example. Um, every year uh, in the garden at my home, my husband is a master gardener and I know nothing about gardening. He does it all. If he tells me to dig a hole here I can do that, but I don't know anything else. Or when he's away, if he says, water these plants or something, I do it, but I wouldn't know to do that myself. So he's in charge, and every year there is this anguishing moment when he starts cutting things, pruning things. And I look at the garden, it's usually, I think it's usually in wintertime or maybe in the fall. January, February. Yeah, yeah, you would know. <coughs> And it's in the winter time. And I look out there after he's done it, or when he's doing it, and I'm horrified. It doesn't look at all like my garden. <laughs> like the garden that I want to see. And he tells me all the time, we have to do it, you'll see. It will come back, it will be better, it will be stronger. Uh, it will look, uh, you know, it, this, this one is, can't survive anymore, it has to go, it's too old, or whatever. You know, he always has explanations for it. And so this really is a case of, we could apply the, the time, the place, the, the people, and the quantity to this example, right? Because the time, so January, February. For the most part of species, yeah. right? And for a different species, it might be a different time. Yeah. So you have to take that yeah, into yeah, consideration. Yeah. Right? It's true. And to everything, there's a season, right? So 
there's a season for plants to be pruned, to be cut, right? Um, there is a place. So in Marlene's fabulous garden in Portugal, uh, it's different than it is in my garden in Paris, or in a garden in Finland, or in a garden in Morocco. You know, it, it, they're different according to the place, too. And my garden in Paris is different than the Jardin de Luxembourg in Paris. You know? It's different. Um, and the, where the tree that needs to be pruned is, is different than where another tree is. So you have to take that into consideration, the time and the place, right? And then you have to take into consideration the people. So you don't want me doing the pruning, <laughs> right? You want him doing it, because he knows. We had a case in, in the garden next door, in Dana, many, many years ago, where we had to cut down a tree. It was a very dramatic the community was divided about, should we cut that tree down or no? <laughs> and, you know, the big one there. Yeah, and, right, right. and, oh, it was terrible. And there were some people to this day, I think, Michel Dubois, thinks that that tree should not have been cut down. But it was, because it was beneficial for the rest of the garden. It was taking up all the sunlight. Nothing else could grow. In the house, it was also dangerous for one of the structures in the garden, and it could fall. Yeah. So it was decided that it would cut, be cut down, and there were ceremonies and rituals <laughs> done around this. And, everything. <laughs> and then someone uh, who was visiting, um, Grajena, um, who was staying there for a month or something, from a very heartfelt place, thought she was doing something good, uh, started working on the stump. Yeah. What is it called? The stump. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's when you cut down a tree and yeah. that's what's Sush. left there. Souche. Souche in French. No, c'est trop. C'est Okay. And, I mean, working on it, like, working on it. She was like, Take stripping off all of the bark and polishing it. Yeah. It was it was terrible. It was really violent what she was doing. But she was doing it from a place of thinking she was doing good and she meant well. She was not the person to do that. I'm using this as an example as people, you know. So a gardener would know you don't do that. Or I don't know. Maybe you do do that, but in any case it was very violent and it was not appropriate. So you have to take into account the time, the place, the people, and the quantity. So how much are you going to prune? How much are you going to... My husband knows how much to cut off those branches. I wouldn't. I, I would either cut off just a little bit, <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, slice off the branch in the wrong place or something. I, I wouldn't know. It's like Grajena, she didn't know the quantity of what to do with that stump. And nothing actually had to be done with the stump, but she wanted to participate. Um, she didn't speak English or French, so no one could really communicate <laughs> <laughs> exactly what needed to be done. <laughs> Is Brashenna still around? Yeah. Is she still around? No. no. I mean, in Poland, but she doesn't come to France. No. Um, so this came to me this morning as an <coughs> example of how non-killing applies in a real-life situation, okay? and how you can look at it from these different, what's appropriate. You know, the deeper you go into your, into your experience of things as they are, the more you have a sense of what's appropriate. But everyone does have a sense of what's appropriate, you just don't pay attention to it often. You know, I say I couldn't do the gardening. I probably could if I dropped my fixed ideas about myself and about the plants. And if I did a little research or learned, I could do it, of course. And I would even know, I even know intuitively that it's appropriate to do what my husband does. I know that. I have my fixed idea, though, so I have a hard time <laughs> accepting that. But I know 
Um, you know, what is really incredible too is that, so in order to, to make the garden grow or plants grow, we need to kill. And in, the, in this practice in general, in Zen practice in general, one of the basic things is, uh, one of the basic points has to do with the self. You know, in the, the famous saying from Dogen about um, to follow the way is to That's the phrase, forget the self. Is what no, it's to, investigate the self. Self. to investigate the self is to forget the self. Right, and so to study the self is to forget the self. So, to follow the way is to study the self, and to study the self is to forget the self. We'll just stop with those two. Forgetting <coughs> the self ultimately means killing the self. If we look at it from this non-killing point of view. So the irony is that we're, this basic precept is non-killing, and yet we're telling you to kill the self all the time. Right? But it's like with the gardening. It's necessary to forget the self. To, we don't say kill the self, but that's what it amounts to. In order to realize what this is all about. In order to honor life, that's what we need to do. In order to... Uh, honor life. In order to uh, eliminate the separations that kill, we need to see this and see through the self. Right? So. That's why we say that this first precept, I think I said it the other day, and Um, you also told me that the first killing we often do is to kill who we are. And so I vow to refrain from killing is first I vow to refrain from killing who I am, the, the human being I am. Qu'est-ce que je t'ai dit J'ai entendu. J'ai entendu que, euh, que bien souvent on tuait l'être humain que nous sommes. Ah oui, 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 oui. Voilà. Et, euh, et donc, -ce que c'est violence à soi-même d'abord. Oui. Donc ça, ça peut éventuellement sembler un peu contradictoire avec ce que tu dis, et à la fois non, je pense. Mais ce que j'ai entendu quand tu l'avais dit en anglais, j'ai entendu « killing » comme « kin in ». La première « kin in » qu'on fait, c'est « je t'ai perdu ». Peut-être. Okay. Mais je comprends. Oui. Yeah, so she's... Sophie was reminding me of something. I don't remember saying it, but it's true. Um, <coughs> that the first killing that we do is to ourselves. So we, by wanting to be someone else, to be something else, to not honor who we are, the life of ourself, that's a form of killing. So we're, we're, viol we're doing violence to ourself in the beginning, before we even start doing it to other people. And often we do it to other people because we don't like who we are, and we want to be something else, and we take it out on them, as it were. Yeah. Um, So, so how, how did that come up? Oh yes, because I was talking about... It, uh, it, it could be confusing what I say uh, just after what you say, because you mm -hmm. said that... It eliminates the separation? I'm killing the self. Killing the self. Killing the self is mm. killing the self. Right. It's not contradictory. It is? It is not no, contradictory. It could seem. Yes. Probably. Well, because it, it could seem contradictory from the sense that um, when we are doing harm to ourselves. It's actually by not honoring who we are. And when we are saying, when, when we are saying, I agree to not be attached to who I think I am, we are honoring who we are. So it's, we are actually doing good for ourselves. 
So the first one, to cease from doing evil, would be to stop wanting to be someone else, thinking that the other is better, or I'm better. You know, that's a big one too. I'm much better than the others. I don't even need to pay attention to them. Uh, whatever. So that would be the first one of stop killing myself. And then the next one to do good for myself would be to honor who I am. And do good in accord with that. Do what is good for that. Um, ultimately, that, that that is who I am. It's not... It's not I, who I think I am, it's all things. That's why we say forget the self, because we have to forget this little identity and see the bigger identity, as it were. You said that to... to avoid killing the human being we are, we have to kill the self. To, to, what did you say? To, to be the human being that we are, we have to kill the self? To be? Yeah, because, I, you know, I, I shouldn't have even introduced this notion of killing the self, but... <laughs> um, because it's not exactly killing. It's more like forgetting or not letting it take up all of the place. You know, mm -hmm. it's more mm -hmm. like that. It's to not be, you know, like Freud said, it's, it, it thinks it's the master of the of the place, and it's not the master. It thinks it's the master of maître dans son demeure. Um, but it's not. Um, so it's to allow it to have its place, not shut it up in the basement, or gag it, uh, but to allow it to be there and say, okay, you know, yeah. But there's also this. And there's also this, as it were. And that's necessary doesn't mean excluding it, it means including it, but including everything. So, that's where this inclusive aspect is. In order to include everything, and this is a big concept, everything, we can't be exclusive with just one thing. So we have to let go of the separations and the ideas and the fixed places that we sit in ourselves in order to open to that's why if you continue on from Dogen's thing of forgetting the self, to forget the self is to be, there's different translations, enlightened by the 10,000 things, or confirmed by the 10,000 things. You can choose your translation. It means that if you're not seeing only this, then you see everything. But if you see only this, you won't see everything. You won't see the others. Um, I like Trungpa Rinpoche's take on the uh, forgetting the self. Um, he says, he talks about it in terms of the Bodhisattva, who is one who has realized this, and then devotes his or her life to helping others to realize it. And so Trungpa says, it's not that the Bodhisattva no longer takes care of himself. Because this is a big trap. We see it as, oh, I'm not going to think of myself anymore. I'm sacrificing myself for all others. It's not that. It's that he doesn't think only about himself anymore. So it's not, I think only about me, or I'm not thinking about me anymore. It's that I don't only think about myself. I am, they are. Or, there, or there's another version of this. Corinne addressed this yesterday to an extent. Um, that it's not that I see myself in all others. It's that I see all others are me. There's a difference there. So I think the phrase is, is actually, maybe it's Dogen actually. A fool sees himself in all others. A wise man sees all, sees everybody, everybody as himself. Um, 
So this first one um, of non-killing can take multiple forms. So like Sophie pointed out this example that I apparently gave of, you know, with yourself. You know, it starts here. But it can also take the form of wanting someone else to be different. Well, then you're killing, as it were, who they are. You're not seeing who they are. You're not seeing uh, things as they are. You're, you're as it were, <coughs> killing things as they are. Um, now, if we have done this first work of forgetting the self, I mean, truly experiencing that, then all of the precepts fall into place, because from that perspective, we would not do, we would not kill, we would not steal, we would not lie. This is, this is, this is utopia I'm talking about. This is the ideal situation. Because at the same time, we violate them all the time. As I said uh, the other day. And the point is just to uh, do the best we can and try to be aware of what we are doing. So I think Bernie, it's Bernie Glassman who gives the example of a glass. We use the glass, our life is like the glass. Okay? We use it to drink, and it's dirty. So it's no longer pure and clean. It's, we're violating it, as it were, by making it dirty. We clean it, and then we use it again. And we clean it, and we use it again. And then he makes it a... somewhere, again, somewhere in these notes, that there's a difference between violating the precepts and breaking them. Breaking the precepts would be to intentionally break the glass. That would be different than using it and cleaning it when it needs to be cleaned. Uh, it's not the same thing as intentionally breaking it. Even if we don't use it, if we just leave the glass sitting there, it will become dirty. So we have to clean it. Dust will gather on it, uh, whatever. So it's a, it's a living process. The precepts are alive. They're not fixed. They are about your life. And uh, using them, following them, uh, studying them, uh, not thinking about them. Uh, even if you don't think about them and you've done the ceremony, somewhere they're with you. Somewhere. And probably you will think about them from time to time. Probably. I never thought I could practice in the Sangha. I never thought I could be committed to Zen practicing. But I began to do it 12 years ago. And six years, uh, seven years ago, I never thought I could do Jukai. And I went to Holland with a huge amount of people and whose Jukai who was given by Genpo Roshi to many, many people at the same time, and I was horrified. How is it possible to, <laughs> to, to give uh, to so many people at the same time, etc. And when I came back in the train, coming back from London to Paris, I was with Brigitte, and I asked her questions about this Jukai, etc. And, uh, and I came to Paris, and I went to see Amy, and I asked her questions about Jukai because I felt I wanted to take Jukai. I didn't decide anything. <laughs> and it came from uh, a horrible, I uh, something which was not nice to me, 
okay, so this general Jukai. Uh, and, um, and maybe, I think that maybe, uh, maybe without understanding the precept, it came to me somehow. And, and the wish came, the, the desire, the, pro, the deep desire came to take to Kai and, and to do it. So it didn't come through this. This was here, and I went to Amy and I told her, I'm so afraid because the ceremony looks like Catholic, and I hate that. <laughs> and, uh, and Amy told me, yes, I know, I am not Catholic, but I know many people are Catholic who are annoyed with that. But she told me about, you told me about ritual, and what you told me about ritual um, allowed me to, see, to, to stop being afraid of the ceremony, because you told me that ritual allows us to go from the personal to the impersonal and to, to leave up just little part of ourselves. Um, yeah, for the little sharing. <laughs> no regrets sharing. Sorry? No regrets. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's true that remember that specific, uh, I've seen Genpo Roshi do that several times with many people, but you know in Japan, uh, that's how it's done all the time. Mm -hmm. no. I don't know, you know, huge amounts of people receiving hundreds. precepts, hundreds. Yeah, hundreds, hundreds of people receiving the precepts all at the same time. Uh, we have, we don't do it that way in the West, at least in our lineage. And I think people even do Jukai several times and things like that. I don't know. Yeah. In Japan. Yeah, every, Japan year. Yeah. every year. Every year. Yeah. Because it's considered as being a purifying and atonement ritual. Right. So, yeah. yeah. And that after that, I saw you giving Jukai to Claudia, Christina, and Juan. So three persons at the same time. And it was absolutely different because you were really here for. Each what I what I felt. I wouldn't say that Gepo was not here personally for each person, but that what I felt. So when I saw you giving Jukai to three person at the same time, it was to the three of them and it was really to each of them. And you were really because I know when you give Jukai that you are absolutely with us. So you were absolutely with each of the person. And I heard and I learned after that you you had received uh, Jukai and we were seven. Mm -hmm. so. But in the same way, she was I'm sure. entirely with yes. each one of us. Sure. Don't you think? Yeah, mm -hmm. I, maybe yeah. I can add a little thing to this. Uh, it's, it's true indeed that in the West, uh, it's specifically for Zen practice, Jukai ceremony has changed aspect. As in Japan, it's a very unpersonal ritual. And in the West, it has become actually a ritual that is uh, symbolically deepening the relationship between the student and, and the teacher, mm -hmm. which is originally wasn't meant like this, but looks like that now in our in our in our lineage. In our lineage, very much in Zen lineage. Not in Yashimaru's lineage. Well, oh yeah, Yashimaru. Well, Yashimaru is. Yeah, but it's a different way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Veshimaru is more Japanese. Exactly. Veshimaru is more Japanese. But, uh, so that's, that, that is a little bit a different has, that has evolved culturally in the transmission of Zen to, to the West. Because we need to be recognized individually. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? Okay. Because we need to be recognized individually. <laughs> it's, it certainly is cultural. Certainly. Certainly cultural and to do with uh, the time, the place, the people. <laughs> you know, it definitely is cultural. And we do have a different notion of individuals, of, of relationships. Uh, 
But you are an organized by any, even if you don't take your cat. <laughs> yes, it's not exclusive in that sense. Yeah. The only relation we have to have a relationship with the teacher. Is, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. It's not. Uh, it's not only that. Did you talk about the absolute perspective? Because I heard the intrinsic, subjective. Well, intrinsic is the absolute perspective. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Well, there's literal. Oh, literal, right. right. Yeah. yeah. And subjective right. and intrinsic or absolute. Yeah. How are we doing for time? Okay. Any other questions or comments? Anyone? Um, about non killing. Uh, um, I've been thinking in regards to the, the, the like, um, Attacks that happened recently um, in the last few years um, that we are like trapped. Um, so, so it's like there are people who don't want um, other people to to exist basically because of their faith opinion or the way they live, and. Um, If you're uh, potentially the target of that, then um, then it seems like you have no choice but to want. So I'll say it briefly, and then I have to explain. But you have no choice but to want to kill the other one. Um, and I'm not saying that we can say. If you if you like uh, somebody could could attack could attack me uh, because I don't know, because he doesn't want me to think what I think or have the opinion that I have then you could you don't you, you could say you don't have to kill them physically you, can, you don't have to kill them as human beings but um, there is another way to kill some to to, to kill them is, is to um, to say that you don't want somebody to um, just saying that it's not okay to uh, so you don't want someone else to think that they can kill you or or other people uh, just because they disagree and you and you and if you have that point of view that you would like um, diversity to be possible uh, among human beings and you would like to um, to allow for people to have different opinions and deal with that um, To defend that and to make that possible, you have to kill the way of life that is about killing what is different. And when I say kill, I mean I mean you can't allow that. Uh, that's and I, and I I mean it feels like it feels like. If you want to defend your way of life, and I mean, no, 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 if you just want to live and you want to um, to be able to live freely and, 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 and you want others to be able to live freely, um, then there is a, a Well, it's a contradiction with the, with the, with the other uh, mindset that is that so 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 I was just thinking that, that it seems to me that the two can't coexist, mm -hmm. and so if you're on 
one side, if, you, if you're on the, on the side of the people who want to, 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 to kill those who don't think they're bad, then you're killing. Right? And if you're not on that side, then someone, you, you, you're killing too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what you say, and that is, that is exactly where we're trapped, you know, um, in a sense. Uh, think of it kind of like cancer. We all have cancer cells in our bodies. And at some point they converge and start being nasty. Uh, in order to favor the life of the body, we need to eliminate those cells. And it involves killing them. Sometimes we succeed, sometimes we don't. Sometimes those cells win and the body then perishes. Um, you know, if we look at it from an intrinsic point of view, as I said, there is no body to born. There's no body. No one born, no one dying. So, but we're not going to go there. That's not what we're talking about. But it, that is one aspect. From the literal point of view, we shouldn't kill. We shouldn't, we shouldn't touch those cancer cells. And there are people, you know, I think the Christian scientists uh, take that position. When we don't intervene and we let the body do what it does. That's the literal perspective on it, of not killing. I'm assuming, I don't know exactly what their position is, but it's something like that. From a subjective point of view, well, there are things that, in order to favor, favorize, to favor the, uh, the harmonious functioning of the body, we need to eliminate these cells that are damaging. In this case that you're talking about, of the one body of the human race, because really it involves all of us. It's not just in Paris, or in France, or in Nice, or in uh, Munich, or wherever this stuff is happening, or Brussels. Um, it's not that we eliminate but if we can, the problem all comes from these, this notion of separation and fixing on identities. And the reason that we then harm others is because we're fixed on our position. If we have this inclusive, you know, like Bernie likes to say in mathematics, it's the universal set that includes all sets. Aren't you a mathematician? No, you're a physicist. Um, you know, it's the set that includes all sets. So, we, we include the, that that aspect exists, of people who want to eliminate people who don't agree with them. We acknowledge it. But, in order to favor the well-being of all of us, we have to eliminate that. And, but we don't have to kill those people. We have to acknowledge them and include them. The reason we have so much trouble, particularly in France, is this entire segment of the population has not been recognized and has not been seen, heard, and given a place. Therefore, what arises from that, from this separation, severe separation of not of have a fixed position, well, this, this is what comes up. The same thing applies throughout the universe. But in this particular situation, that's, you know, and we can take different form. What do we do? Well, the only thing you can do is start where you are. You know, in your community, in your neighborhood, in your street, in your shop. The guy who sells you the vegetables. Uh, whatever, you know. Um, your colleagues. That's where it has to start. Um, and this great image from this movie that I saw years and years ago, Dancing with Wolves. Did you see that movie? Yeah. Long time ago, with Kevin Costner. And it takes place during the American Civil War. So you have a situation where these two sides are just ripping each other apart. And they're brothers. We're all brothers, humans. And we're ripping each other apart. But in this case, it's you know one nation, different sides, and they're ripping each other apart. And he gets wounded, this guy, in the beginning, Kevin Costner's character, he gets wounded. And they want to cut off his leg because it's a bad wound. And when the doctor manages to pull on his boots, grabs a horse, gets on the horse, he's fed up with the whole thing. 
There's a battle raging out there on two sides of a meadow. He gets on the horse and rides across the meadow between the two sides. Like this. It's a fabulous image. He's just like this. What happens? They all put down their guns. At least for that time. Nobody shoots at him. This is our role as bodhisattvas. I mean, it doesn't mean you're going to go. <laughs> you know, the guy has a suicide vest and you're going to go there like this. You know, no, it doesn't mean that. It's before that. It's before we get to that point that this has to happen. And, of course, we can't make the entire world do that, but we can have an influence on what we do. And these precepts are aiming at that. So you, in your life, how do you approach this? That, that's absolutely the whole point of precepts. Thank you for bringing up that example, because that's it, right there. I think we have to stop. It's lunchtime. The time, the place, the people, the situation. <laughs> Thank you.